Hey guys, can you hear me? By the grace and mercy of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, just I agree with you that Christian. Okay, all right, we're all on. Okay, don't forget, folks. I'm at my brother's house for now. Hopefully, in Jesus' name. He'll bless me with the provisions, get my own place. So that means the internet connection here is not the best, right? The internet connection is not the best. So it's going to buffer. So, but pray by the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that the buffering <clears throat> remains at a minimum by his grace and mercy. But that's how it's going to be. New Year's is around the corner. Hopefully in the year to come. The Lord Jesus will take us to higher levels of holiness, of righteousness, of purity, of love, of devotion, of faithfulness and worship. And that the Lord Jesus will just strengthen us to walk more faithfully, to be more in love with him and to be more bold for his glory and to be more like him. <clears throat> and the way we love him and love one another for the glory of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? So I'm hoping for big changes in the year to come by the mercy of Jesus Christ for miraculous deliverance by the mercy of Jesus Christ for the sake of my daughters and that I will be free of all these satanic shackles by the holy blood of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So pray if God is pleased, if he wants me to stick around for a while, that the Lord Jesus will take all of us, take me to a higher level of holiness and purity and love and devotion of worship of faithfulness. Give us more <clears throat> wisdom and knowledge, understanding of his word and the power to live it out perfectly without shame, without compromise for the glory of Jesus. Even if it means that we go to jail and die for his word. Right. And pray the Lord Jesus will help me to get healthier for his glory if he wants me around. And to love the brethren more passionately and that he will fight for my children for the glory of Jesus, that he'll fight for them and protect them and preserve them. In Jesus' almighty name, Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Wash us in the blood of Jesus, Father. Cleanse us and purify us and our loved ones. My daughters, in the blood of Jesus, Father. Sanctify us by your Spirit, Father. And forgive us for failing and indulging the flesh. Crucify our flesh and deliver us from our flesh, Father. And Father, I ask in Jesus' name, bless this session. Save me from error and confusion and unrighteous anger. Anoint my mouth to speak truth clearly in the power of the Holy Spirit with wisdom from the Holy Spirit. And Father, enable me to recall and interpret scriptures perfectly and bless your people here. Fill them with wisdom and knowledge and insight and understanding. Boldness and love and faithfulness, Father. To know your word, to live your word, to proclaim your word, to love your word, and even die for your word. Your word is truth. The Bible is your word. And Jesus is the living word who became flesh. Save us from attacks of the enemy and destroy all distractions, Father. And anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Father, for the glory of Jesus and sanctify our hearts and motives, not to do it for the praise of men, not to do it for fame or fortune, but do it because Jesus is worthy. Your son is worthy. Your heart become flesh is worthy. And help us to truly love him the way he deserves to be loved. Be with us, Father, in this session and be with my daughters, Father. Bless them. Remind them that you love them and that you're with them and you'll save them, Father. We love you, Abba. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> in Jesus' name, amen. Yehovah, Father, Son, Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, Spirit. Okay, guys. Like I said, the internet may go out. May the Lord Jesus beatify me for his glory. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to your ears. Guide this conversation. Again, <clears throat> thank you for being here. Hopefully, we'll get more people to come. Like I said, and I say this, by the way, I say this jokingly. Some people don't know that we're joking. You know, David Wood and I, we banter back and forth. And people wonder, oh, you got a problem with David Wood? David, no, no. Let me say it again. David Wood, Anthony Rogers, Edward Dalcor. Vocab Malone, Adam Coleman, John, what do you mean, McRae, Christian Prince, Osama Dokdok, Al Fadi, Hatun Tash, 
Jay Smith, just to name a few, there are many, are my brothers and sisters whom I love passionately. And I plead the blood of Jesus Christ to cover us and that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, that our bond is unbreakable by the power of the Holy Spirit. They are my brothers and sisters whom I will gladly serve for the glory of Jesus Christ. So don't take it seriously when we banter back and forth. Because and I, I tell people and they'll say, oh, you got to beef with David Wood? Hater Wood. Hopefully we can get our numbers up over 200 eventually to get 900, 1,000 watching these streams. If someone as boring as David Wood can get 900, come on, guys. But keep praying for us in Jesus' name. And pray for the provisions, right? For the glory of Jesus Christ, Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. And again, I just want to thank you for being here again. Thank you for praying for me and standing with me and supporting me and my daughters for the sake of Jesus. I want to thank all the admins here, first and last, Protestant and the rest. And thank Protestant Believer for posting verses, helping me to help you. He's a blessing to me to bless you for the sake of Jesus Christ. He doesn't get paid for doing this. In fact, not only does he not get paid for doing this, I want you to see this right here. Okay. You see this? Okay. Let me see if I can see the screen. Yeah, okay. This just came in the mail today, courtesy of Protestant Believer. So not only does this brother serve us, for the glory of Jesus Christ, for free, doesn't get paid. He spent money, took money out of his own pocket to purchase this Quran for me and deliver it overnight. So I don't even pay him to help me. And yet he not only does it for free because he loves Jesus, he sent this to me. So thank the Lord for this brother, right? Thank the Lord Jesus for every one of you. And I want to acknowledge everyone that has partnered with me financially, you know who you are. I know I need to get around to start emailing you guys. Give me some time. It may be a while, but I just want to say, I thank you for your financial support because God has called us into full-time ministry and the Lord provides through his people. So bless you, Lord Jesus, shine his face on you. And, and thank you again that for the sake of Jesus, you are partnering with me financially. Thank you. May God bless you and the Lord Jesus seal you for loving his servants enough to partner with them, right? So, so thank you so much. You know who you are, and God willing, in the upcoming months, hopefully I'll have time to personally email every one of you. And those of you who can't contribute financially but are praying for me, watching the videos, and using this information, thank you. The Lord Jesus bless you and seal you and fill you with his spirit. Because I know not everyone is able to contribute financially. What matters to me is that you pray intensely and even fast for my daughters and I. That God will bless us and protect us. Because your prayers are more important. I'm not trying to downplay the blessing of my brothers and sisters who do contribute financially. But in reality, we serve a God who's infinitely rich. And God can turn stones into bread, can make bread from stones to provide for our needs. What we need is prayer warriors, people filled with the Spirit, sold out for the glory of Christ, and just seeking God's face intensely in prayer and fasting. I need your prayers and your fasting. Pray for me and fast <clears throat> for me so that the Lord will bless me and my daughters and enable me to do this. So those of you who cannot contribute financially, you are not loved any less. I love you just as much because your prayers are powerful in the heavenly realm. And through your prayers, God can rain manna from heaven. So thank you, and Lord bless you for your prayers and your fasting. I appreciate you, and I love you guys, right? I love you guys for the sake of Jesus. And my love can't do anything for you. What's important is that Jesus loves you. He's in love with you. And because he's in love with you, he is almighty, all powerful to save you and preserve you. All right. So praise his holy name and God bless you all. Right. Ah, oh, here we go again. Bilardo Christian, you don't want to get blocked, do you? Do you want to get blocked? Did you ever come here with your silly nonsense of Muhammad did pretending to be a Christian? Ah, pins and needles, needles and pins, right? 
So I thank you guys for praying and fasting. And again, please hit the like button. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe. Listen to the arguments. Memorize the arguments by the power of the Holy Spirit. And use these arguments to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to advance his kingdom, right? Oh, really, Abdul Halaj? My debate with Shabir Ali? Guys, just for the record, I believe it was in 2001. That was my first public debate. First public debate. And I debated a seasoned deceiver, a seasoned son of Satan, Shabir Ali. Imagine now if Shabir were to debate me, what I would do to him. What now? It's almost what? 19 years later? 2001, I believe. But again, just to let you know. Oh, Abdul Halaj, thank you, brother. Thank you. Uh, just to let you know, we we also have other debaters that have debated Shabrali. In fact, we have Chris Claus here. Chris Claus, his first public debate was with Shabrali. So if you guys don't know who Chris Claus is, I need you guys to remember your brothers and sisters who are in the battle lines doing ministry, <clears throat> bringing down the kingdom of darkness by the power of the Holy Spirit with the blood of Jesus being their covering. Chris Claus is one of them. Protest believer is another. First and the last is another. Revelation 22, 13. He has a YouTube page. Psalm 23. We have so many soldiers in the front lines that you guys need to know, need to pray for, love and support. Chris Claus is one of them. And also you need to join the battle. Don't be passive observers. Be active in the battle because you're warriors for Jesus. And you, you fight against the kingdom of darkness by preaching the gospel, by answering objections, by praying, fasting, worshiping the Lord, singing to the Lord, obeying the Lord, and loving the Lord, and saying his word. Right? So keep it up, right? Now, you guys ready? I'm trusting the Lord Jesus to loosen my tongue to speak clearly. Because I want to finish the Christmas story, the star of Bethlehem. And then we're going to go into whose glory did Isaiah see in Isaiah chapter 6? Whose glory did Isaiah see in Isaiah chapter 6? Some of you don't know, but I don't know. Should Protestant, should I mention Discord or should I not? As you can tell, see, man, I, I need to widen my shoulders, dude. Okay. Protestant believer. It's part of a group called Discord. I think it's discord.com. It's the alternative to Pal Talk. And there you can go in and chat either texting or on the mic, voice, voice chat or text chat. And I've been joining them this past week. I've been on Discord this past week. And yesterday I spent maybe two hours in an in depth discussion on the glory that Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6, right? And the day before, we, we went into a very in-depth discussion that centered more on a philosophical nature, right? We were talking about God being pure actuality without having any potentiality. And what does that mean philosophically? And is such a teaching anchored in the scriptures of God? So we really went in-depth, intense. And one thing I can tell you, I am not a scholar of any subject. I am not a scholar of philosophy or theology. I am a student of the Bible, a student trusting in the Holy Spirit, depending on the Holy Spirit, begging the Holy Spirit to fill me for the glory of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is our God, our Lord, our life, he is our creator, he is our maker, our sustainer, our provider, our fashioner, our teacher, our instructor, our regenerator, who rejuvenates us, who refreshes us, who seals us and saves us for the glory of Jesus. He is fully God, eternally God, and worthy of all love, praise, and worship. So we need to be in love with the Holy Spirit just as much as we are in love with the Father and the Son because the Spirit is the eternal Spirit of the Father and the Son and one with them in the Godhead. So we depend on the Holy Spirit. And I depend on the Holy Spirit. He is my teacher. He is my Lord, my God, my love. He corrects me. 
He chastens me. He disciplines me. He empowers me. He enables me. He instructs me. And he does that for every one of you. Right? So I am no scholar. I'm a student. And I definitely want to be the student of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it's Discord. A Protestant believer can put the link. Let me refute another know-it-all. And by the way, guys, let me just share with you guys. Let me be honest with you guys. Okay. Help me to help you. And here's how you can help me to help you. I want to be a blessing to you and not a curse. Don't come to my comment section and don't go come to my live stream being a know-it-all and pontificate and try to argue with me. You're not going to last. You're going to get blocked. It's not because I'm afraid of challenges. I'm not. There's a time to challenge me, and it's not to challenge me in the comment section or in my live stream. You want to challenge me? Invite me to an open discussion, and we will discuss. So we had some. See, again, if I if I treat him as he deserves, people are going to say, you're not being Christ-like, fam. I don't see humbleness in you. I don't see Jesus in you. We had some idiot coming to my comment section named Neutral who's about to get neutralized because he thinks he's a know-it-all. He knows the Bible. He was stupid enough to try to tell me how to teach and how not to teach. And he was stupid enough to say that Jesus wasn't a servant of man, that Jesus became a servant of God the Father, but he wasn't a servant of man because he's not less than human. This again shows you why people like him are dangerous. Here's why. There are people who think they are wise and know scripture, and they don't, and they do great damage by perverting the scripture. May the Holy Spirit save me from that and save us from that. May the Holy Spirit give us the grace to know our limitations and be open to learn and not pontificate in our ignorance and twist scriptures. Let me show you that Jesus Christ is not just the servant of the Father when he came to the earth. Jesus took on the role and status of a servant on earth, yes, to be the servant of his father, but also to be the servant of mankind, to serve mankind. Let's go to Romans 15, verse 8. See, this is what happens when you have idiots who think they know scripture, but they are buffoons, only twisting scripture to their shame and humiliation. Romans 15, verse 8. Now I say... That Jesus was a minister of the circumcision. That word minister also means servant. So Paul says Jesus was a servant of the Jews because minister of the circumcision means those who are circumcised physically. So Jesus was a servant of the Jews for the sake of their salvation, for the sake of the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. <clears throat> okay, Now, let's go to Mark 10, 45. Let me just deal with this. Because I cannot stand when people think they know scripture and they pontificate only to embarrass themselves. It really upsets me. Romans 15, verse 8. Okay, And then we're going to get into the heart of the matter. Mark 10, 45. We read Romans 15, 8. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto. He didn't come expecting people to minister, to serve him in his first coming while he was on earth. But to minister, to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So the context is inarguable. He comes to serve those that he ransoms by offering his soul for their redemption. So don't let any idiot tell you that Jesus didn't become a servant of mankind. A servant to serve mankind by offering his life, his soul, for their salvation. Okay? Is that clear? Is that clear? do something if that's clear let's begin what was the star of bethlehem let's talk about that the star of bethlehem now i know some people believe that the star was some phenomenon in the sky or in space right and there are people who have looked at ancient records to see if there was un any unusual activity in the stars in space and some people believe they have found such phenomenon that directly relates to the star that the wise men saw when they came looking for the king of Israel, the king of the Jews. The king of Israel, the king of the Jews, right? So if you believe that, that's fine. 
right? And again, I'm trusting the Lord Jesus to fill us and fill me and to save me from error. If you believe it's referring to an actual astral <clears throat> phenomenon, shiny object in space, that God in his sovereignty <clears throat> manipulate. When I say manipulate, I use that reverently. I'm not saying manipulate in a bad way, right? As a sign to these astrologers who had converted to the true faith and knew who the true God was and were worshipers of the true God, that the king of Israel is born. That's fine. You can believe that. I actually believe it's not referring to a shiny object. I don't believe it's referring to the stars in space. I actually believe that the star in Matthew 2, and this is my belief, my conviction, I can be wrong, and I'm not the only one who holds this, right? But it is my belief, okay? It is my belief that it's referring to a spirit being, a spirit creature, a luminous, right? Radiant spirit creature <clears throat> that appeared as a shiny object to the wise men in order to bring them to Jesus Christ. That's my belief, right? Now, if you disagree, that's okay. But don't debate me. Don't, don't challenge me. We can agree to disagree because, I, like I said, there are two positions. There are those Christians who believe that it is an object in space, that God orchestrated events, right, <clears throat> so that... The coming of the wise men to Jesus when he was about two years old, that event coincided with some astral phenomenon, phenomenon in space that God orchestrated as a sign to them that the king of Israel has already been born and you will find the child in Bethlehem. Now, we know Jesus wasn't a babe at that time. He was around two years old. And we know that if you go back and listen to the previous sessions, this is now the fourth session I did on the subject of the wise men and the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the fourth subject. So if you want to get the meat of this, go back and listen to the three previous sessions. This is now session number four on the Christmas story, on the wise men, and the celebration of the coming of the incarnate Son of God, God in flesh, God being born as a human baby, becoming a human baby, a human child, and a human adult, right? Matthew 2 clearly shows that Jesus Christ was at least two years old, living in a house when the wise men found him and worshipped him as the God-man. But listen to the three previous sessions, because I can't repeat the material that I've already discussed by the grace of God's Spirit as we trust the Spirit to guide me to speak truth without error. Amen? We trust the Holy Spirit and we yield to you. Now, coming back to the issue. Is there proof from Scripture that spirit creatures can be described as stars? Where the term star is used not for a shiny object in space, but as a symbol for a spirit being, one that's very luminous and radiant, right? Yes. Are you now ready to dig in by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? Can the term star and is the term star used in scriptures for spirit creatures, especially luminous, radiant spirit creatures? Of course. Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. Whoa. And I'm going to give you an interesting interpretation of this passage by Jehovah's Witnesses. Pray that I don't bore you, but that I am used of the Spirit to bless you and illuminate you for the glory of Christ. Yes, I'm going to talk about that too. Abd al halij I'm going to talk about the star of Jacob in Numbers 24, 17. I'll get there too, Lord willing, because I plan on doing multiple sessions, not just one or two. As you pray for my health, pray for my holiness, pray for my provision and my children. I'm here to serve you until Jesus takes me home. I'm here to serve you until I die or Jesus descends. I'm here to serve you as long as Jesus wants to use me to serve you. Right? Revelation 9 verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. 
And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So this star is a him who was given authority to rule over the bottomless pit. So is this a, 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 a shiny object in space that fell to the earth? Is that what Revelation 9.1 is talking about? Is that what it's talking about? This star that fell from heaven to the earth. He's given the keys, meaning he has authority over the bottomless pit. Who was or is this star? Revelation 9.11. Revelation 9.11. There you go. No, Andrew Martin. Andrew Martin. Number one, the term Lucifer is not necessarily Satan's name. Number two, Isaiah 14, 12, if you read the context clearly, that's not speaking of Satan. It's speaking of the king of Babylon. I did sessions on this, Andrew. I think you've listened to it, but go back, re-listen to those sessions because this shows and confirms the point that I make repeatedly, Andrew. The point I make repeatedly is that we are creatures of repetition we need to hear something over and over and over again by the grace of God's Spirit, by the grace of the Holy Spirit as he loosens my tongue, until it becomes second nature, and we can then use that information and pass it on to others. Yeah, Hillel ben Shekhar, Isaiah 14, 12. Okay? So if you go back and listen to the sessions, I want to end up on showing that the context of Isaiah 14 is not about Satan. And even the term Lucifer, Andrew Martin, is the Latin translation of Hillel. And we have Abd al-Halij, who knows Hebrew. Hillel means shining one. The Hebrew phrase is Hillel ben Shachar. Shining one, son of the morning, son of the dawn. Right? So when you say, is this star Lucifer? By Lucifer, you mean Satan? No. This star is the angel who will confine Satan in the abyss. Did you know that, Andrew Martin? Revelation 9 says, this star is Abaddon, Apollyon, which in Hebrew and Greek means the destroyer. And he's given authority to bind Satan in the abyss, the abyss of the bottomless pit. Revelation 9, 11. Let's read it. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue have this name Apollyon. So notice this angel is that star. That fell from heaven and was given the keys to the bottomless pit. What is his name? In Hebrew, it's Abaddon. In Greek, Apollyon. And that means destroyer. This is the angel who destroys. Destroys who? The wicked, evil spirits, and Satan by the authority of Christ. How do I know that this angel... Who is the star that has authority over the abyss will confine the devil in the bottom, a bottomless pit so that he's not the devil? Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. No, Ejel, it's not really incorrectly. It's giving you the meaning of the Hebrew. Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. Andrew, everyone else, listen to who the star is. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit. Did you guys make the connection? Revelation 9, 1 says, A star fell from heaven to the earth and was given the key to the bottomless pit. But in Revelation 20, verse 1, did you see? That star is said to be the angel. I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he la laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he might be loosed a little season. Now let's compare Revelation 9-1 with Revelation 20, verse 1 again. Revelation 9-1 and Revelation 20, verse 1, back to back. It 
Is this Bible amazing or what? I don't know. See, Protestant, just because I just praised you for buying me a book and quoting passages, you do not have the right to keep quoting the wrong verses. I don't know if it's old age and you're getting Alzheimer's. You've been doing this for the past two weeks. I, I say Revelation 9-1 and you give me Genesis 50 verse 20. What's going on with you, old man? Are you that old? I'm going to send the book back and I'm going to fire you. Keep it up. Okay, Revelation 9-1, Revelation 20 verse 1. All right. Yeah, but no, you know what his excuse is? I'm giving you bonus verses, Sam. I'm giving you extra verses, so don't hate. I'm giving you more Bible. You should appreciate that. Don't you want more Bible? All right, anyway. Revelation 9, 1 and 20, verse 1. Yep. And the fifth angel sounded, and I star, saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So the star came down from heaven. He has the key, the keys to the bottomless pit. Now notice Revelation 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven. Okay, is it clear? The star that came down that fell from heaven, who has the key to the bottomless pit, is an angel, and his name is Abaddon in Hebrew, Apollyon in Greek. Is it clear? Everyone got it before I move on? So no one can deny the term star can be used and is actually used in reference to spirit beings. Now, not every star is a spirit creature. Did you know that? Not every star is a spirit creature. What do I mean? The term star can also refer to human beings. So the term star can refer to a spirit creature or a human creature. But there is one place where the word star is used neither for a human creature nor a spirit creature, but for the God-man. Did you know that Jesus calls himself the morning star? And Jesus is not a creature. He is God Almighty who became flesh. So though he took to himself the nature of a man, a human nature that he created, he is an eternal person, a divine person who is uncreated by nature. Revelation 22, 16. Revelation 22, 16. Jesus calls himself the morning star. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Bam! There you go. Jesus calls himself a star. And yet he's not a spirit creature. Sorry, guys. It's going to buffer. Pray in Jesus' name. Pray. Like I told you, this internet connection is not the best, so it's going to buffer. Just pray in Jesus' name. The connection stays strong. No, Turb. Morning Star is not a specific title, specifically of the devil. Turb, you need to go back and listen to the sessions. Isaiah 14, 12 is not about Satan. This is why I keep saying, folks, please do me a favor. Do me a favor. You need to go back and watch all the previous sessions. I have a lot of sessions on my YouTube channel. Don't just listen to the recent ones. Go back and listen to the very first one. Listen to them so that you, you're up to date. Ask Holy Spirit to guide you into making sure that you only accept that which is correct on my part and where I'm mistaken, the Spirit protects you from it and convicts me to realize where I'm mistaken so that I can correct myself for the glory of Christ, as well as my articles. But I've answered this, and I'm going to answer it again. Isaiah 14, in the context, is not about Satan. It's about the king of Babylon. Can it be applied to Satan? Can, Satan, in other words, can... 
the description about the king of Babylon be extended to Satan? It can, because behind every world leader, world ruler who opposes God, who defies God, who doesn't know God, you have an evil spiritual influence working in and through that world leader. Okay? Okay, but is the title Morning Star a title used exclusively for a particular entity? No. Morning Star is not an exclusive title used particularly for a specific entity. No. Are you with me there? But do you see the point that Jesus Christ in Revelation 22, 16 calls himself a star, a bright morning star, a bright and morning star? Now, some people believe the morning star is a reference to the star the Venus, right? Now, why... Do people believe that this is referring to Venus? And why call yourself Venus? Because have you ever looked out in the horizon right before dawn? Right before dawn, at the crack of dawn, <clears throat> you see a very shining star in space. That's the star Venus. And what does that signify? When you see that star in the, in the early morning, right before dawn, that's an indication the sun is about to rise. Dawn is about to break through. The sun is about to rise. So what Jesus is saying is that he is that morning star that shines right when the sun rises. In other words, he is the star that signals the coming of the Son of God to destroy the darkness in the earth. That's what it represents. Right? Yep. Venus is the star that you see early in the morning right before dawn. Don't take my word for this. I learned this by just reading, reading like commentaries. You know, like I said, none of us know everything. But now notice the connection with Jesus. When it's at its darkest, early morning, Venus shines in space. Brightly, and that's an indication dawn is about to break through. So then what does the morning star refer in respect to Christ? He is the sign that the sun is about to rise upon the darkness, destroying the darkness. You get my point? Is that clear? The Son of God is about to dawn upon the darkness of this world, to destroy the darkness of this world by His glorious light in His second coming. See? Thank you, Miron. Sam, you're right on this. I've seen Venus early in the morning countless of times. So now, Miron, you understand why Jesus would then describe Himself as the morning star? Right? Right? Is that clear? So I want to make sure you understand what the symbol of bright and morning star means in reference to Jesus. Yep, exactly, the evening star as well. But more and more particular, it's called the morning star, Protestant believer. Why is it called the morning star? Not the evening star, the morning star. Because that's the star that shines the brightest right at the break of dawn, signifying that dawn is about to break through and the darkness is about to disappear. Why do you think it's bright and morning star, not evening star, right? Are you guys making the connection there now? Is it making sense? Okay. So I think I've shown you proof. The term star can be used in reference to sentient, conscious beings, whether a spirit creature, like in Revelation 9, 
can even be used of human beings. And it's even used in reference to Jesus, the God-man. And Jesus is no creature. He's the eternal God, an eternal divine person who took on a human nature that he created and a physical body that he created, right? So you see now proof that star can refer to what I call sentient, intelligent beings. <clears throat> More particularly, it can refer to a spirit being, right? And let me give you the final proof. Job 38, verse 7. Job 38, verse 7. So then we can go into the star of Bethlehem. When the morning star sang together and all the sons of God shouted, shouted for joy. Now in context, God is telling Job, were you there when I laid the foundation of the earth and I created the earth as a tabernacle for man to dwell in and for me to dwell with man? The answer is no, you weren't there, Job, because when God created the earth, fashioned the earth to be a tabernacle, there were no human beings. But they were sentient beings, intelligent beings who observed God create the earth. So the question is, who were those beings that saw the creator create and fashion the earth as a temple, a tabernacle for God and man to dwell together? Because it says, when God finished laying the foundation of the earth, the morning stars sang together and the sons of God, all of them shouted for joy. Right? Do you see it? So the morning stars here are spirit beings. The morning stars here are the sons of God. They're spirit creatures. So here's another time where spirit beings, particularly angelic creatures, are called stars. Morning stars. Now in this context, why are they called morning stars? Because they are shining beings, luminous beings that when you see them, they radiate and shine. Right? So here they're called morning star because like, you, like Venus in the sky that shines and you see its brightness, these spirit beings are luminous, radiant. They shine. And if you want proof... Read Daniel chapters 8, 9, and 10 to see the description of those spirit beings, how luminous and radiant they are. Yep. Okay, so did everyone see proof that the term star can refer to sentient, intelligent beings and can refer to spirit beings, angelic creatures, even though not every star is a creature, because Jesus is the bright and morning star. He's no creature. He's the eternal creator of all things who became flesh. And that flesh that he took was created. If this is making sense, I can move on. I can move on if it's making sense. If anyone's confused, let me know. And I pray the Spirit will anoint my words and make the sound of my voice pleasing so that I can take you captive for the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, with that said, let's go to back, back to Matthew 2. Let's read the first eight verses. Matthew 2, verses 1 to 8 to see what the text says about the star and why I believe it's a spirit being. Read with me carefully and prayerfully. As we trust the Spirit to guide us into all truth and save me from error. Okay, let's read carefully. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came, came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Pay attention to the language, folks. Saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews, the king of Israel? For we have seen his star in the east. So they came from the east, and the star shown in the east they saw the star in the east and are come to worship him notice the language can mean they saw the star while they were in the east or the star shown in the east where they were at and guided them to herod 
You understand? The language can mean either or. The language can mean they saw the star shining while they were in the east, or the star appeared in the east and guided them on their journey. Right? So seeing his star in the east can mean we were in the east and we saw his star from afar off, or we saw a star that was unusual, and we knew there's something unusual about the star, and it guided us here. Okay? Let's read carefully to see if we can understand the point. Now, verse 3. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Now, pay attention. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. Thus it is written by the prophet. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily, privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. When exactly did the star appear to you guys? So then they give him the calculation. And he sent them to Bethlehem. And said, go and search diligently for the young child. And when he hath found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Guys, read carefully as we trust the Spirit to guide us to handle this text reverently and to protect us from error. Notice they saw a star in the east, which means either the star shone in the east where they're at, or they were in the east and they saw the star afar off. And as they followed the star, they landed in, in Jerusalem. Keep that in mind because I have a question for you. Now let's read 9 to 11. Exactly, Miron. See, Miron, you're thinking. God bless you. You're thinking where I'm going. <laughs> when they heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them. Wait, so this star moves? Till it came and stood over the young child was. Wow, a star that even moves and even stops at the exact location of the house of the child. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, Gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now let's think about the implication. If they were seeing the star while they were in the east, not that the star was in the east, then why did they end up in Jerusalem? Why didn't they follow the star until they saw the star shining on, on top of the house? Sorry, like I said, it's going to buffer. It's going to buffer, so be patient, brethren. It's okay. Okay, now notice. If this was a star that they saw from afar off, they're in the east. They see the star. Why then did they end up in Jerusalem? Why didn't they simply follow the star to the house? Because notice what the text says. The star stood on top of where the child was. Now, doesn't this imply that the star rose in the east and the star moved and they followed the star? And when they got to Jerusalem, the star didn't appear. So they ended up inquiring of Herod and then the star reappeared and they followed the star as the star moved and guided them to the house. Even if they had to go through Jerusalem, that's fine. They go through Jerusalem. They don't need to ask where the king would be born, Andrew, because the star would have been shining on top of the house. They would have found the child at that location where the star stood. You get my point, Andrew? So even if there are walls, they had to go through the walls. Okay. To enter through Jerusalem. 
They don't need to ask Herod where the king of Israel will be born. They'll say, hey, we're here because the king of Israel is born and we know where he's at because there's a star over there. Come follow us, Herod, and we'll see. You can come with us too. See what's happening here? Before I move on, I want this to sink in. No, but Jesus, our Passover lamb, if you've been listening to the previous sessions, the wise men did not come to Jesus at the same time that the angels began singing. <clears throat> and the angel appeared to the shepherds to tell them that the, the child had been born. Luke 2 takes place when Jesus was born. Mary had just given birth to him. And she had swaddled him in cloths. The wise men came two years later. When the wise men came, Jesus wasn't a baby anymore. He was about two years old living in a house. It's not the same event. It's one of those traditions that I debunked in the previous sessions. So I kept saying, you have to hear the three previous sessions. But now think with me as we trust the Spirit to guide us. Think with me. Think with me. Okay. If the star was already shining where Jesus was living in the house and the wise men saw the star while they were in the east, why then do they stop at Herod? Why not continue all the way to where the star was? And why are they asking Herod where the king of Israel would be born? Surely they would know because the star is lighting upon the house. Here we go again. Tundra, who told you they are three wise men? Topaz, you're still not getting it though. If the star was shining on top of the house where the child was, they won't need to go to the palace. They'll follow until they see where the star has set. And the star wasn't set on top of the palace. It was hovering over the house. Andra. I'll give you 20 million bucks if you show me in Matthew 2. It says they were three wise men. Three wise men. Thunder, I just said, go listen to the three previous sessions. I answer all of these. I'm not going to answer them again in this fourth session. This is session number four. Okay, now everyone with me here? You understand? So this means contextually when it says the star... They saw the star in the east. It doesn't mean they were in the east and they saw the star from afar off. It actually supports the star appeared to them in the east and guided them. Then for some reason, the star disappeared. So then they had to inquire of Herod, hey, where is the king of Israel? And then after the conversation, coincidentally, the star shows up again and starts moving and guides them to the exact location of the child. Does that sound like the movement of a regular star in space? Or does this sound like a supernatural being? Exactly, Seratid Spork. You even anticipated what I was about to ask and answer. Seratid Spork got it. Doesn't this sound like a supernatural being? appearing as a star in order to communicate on their level, being astrologers who study the stars, so it appears as a star to get their attention. Hey, look at that star. Boy, that's an unusual star. Hey, look, it's traveling. Let's follow it, right? Everyone with me so far? If you got the point, why I believe it's a supernatural being and not a shiny object in space that God guided in such a way to get their attention to bring them to Christ. Because note again what the text said. Reread it for yourself. Let me repeat. 
I repeat a point more than once so it can sink in by the grace of God's spirit. The context strongly supports that the star rose in the east, not that they were in the east and they saw the star from afar off. And the star guided them, but all of a sudden when they got to Jerusalem, the star disappeared, which is why they then inquire of Herod, hey, where is the one born king, king of the Jews, the king of Israel? We saw his star. We want to know where he's at. So now Herod has to inquire of the scholars of the Old Testament, is there a prophecy in the Old Testament that tells us where Messiah be born? Yes, Bethlehem. And then after that conversation, they leave the palace and boom, the star shows up again and starts moving in the direction of where the child is in Bethlehem. Correct? This is very unusual activity for a shiny object in space. No, he didn't recognize it as a unique star, Abd al Haraj. What he recognizes is that something amazing must be taking place for wise men of the East to show up out of nowhere inquiring about the king of Israel when Herod thought he's the king of the Jews, an Edomite and a Dumian who thought he's the true king of the Jews. So he sees this as a threat to his throne. Everyone with me so far? Before we move on? Is it making sense? So I want to make sure you're getting it. Now, let me tell you how Jehovah's Witnesses interpret this passage. And for a while, I thought they may have been right. But by the grace of God's Spirit, I see they're actually wrong. You know how Jehovah's Witnesses interpret that passage? You guys want to know how they interpret it? And it made sense to me when I first heard it. They actually believe that star was an evil spirit. An evil spirit that guided the wise men to stir up Herod to kill Jesus. Because, you know, they ask, why did the star all of a sudden disappear when they reached Herod? If this star was from God, why not guide them directly to Jesus? And avoid getting Herod's attention, stirring up his wrath to seek the life of the child. Isn't this proof that this was an evil spirit? Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Now, but think about why they say this. Folks, not everything Joe's witnesses believe is wrong. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Because they also believe in the virgin birth. Are they wrong? See, this is the problem with Christians. They get so reactionary that if anything comes from, let's say, a cult group or even Islam, it's got to be false. No, there are a lot of things they believe that are true. Let's understand their reasoning. If this was a righteous spirit being, a righteous agent of God... Why God guide them to Herod, stirring up Herod's wrath to kill the child? Would God do that? Isn't this proof that the star was an evil, malevolent being misguiding the wise men to Herod, to stir up Herod to kill the child Jesus? You with me there? Sounds almost reasonable, right? Now, I'll tell you why, though at first point, at first glance, I thought they had a case, but now I see no. It's not so much that the star is guiding them to Herod to stir up his wrath to kill the child, as it is God's witness to Herod, the true king of Israel has been born. You need to sub submit to him, otherwise you'll be destroyed in his wrath. It's not so much the star is guiding them with the intention of stirring up Herod to kill the child as it is his intention to give a witness to Herod, the long-awaited God-man, the true king of Israel, is born. What are you going to do with him? Will you bow the knee or oppose him to your destruction?
You see the point? Come on, guys, hit that like button. Everyone with me? So it does not follow that the star brings them to Herod. That means the star's intention was to get the child killed. No, on the contrary, this was God's witness to Herod and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The Messiah has come. The true king of Israel is here. And now God expects you and everyone to submit to him and worship him. Otherwise, suffer God's wrath. After all, because of the wise men, even the scribes quoted a prophecy, Micah 5.2, which they knew prophesied the birthplace of the Messiah, and therefore they knew if what the wise men are saying is true, our Messiah has been born. He's here. Let's look at it again. Matthew 2. Let's read 4 to 6. Matthew 2, 4 to 6. Matthew 2, verses 4 to 6. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, notice all of them in his court, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, it was to fulfill... Okay, look, Daniel chiming in. And thou, Bethlehem, uh, Daniel, do me a favor. Don't help me to help you. Just listen. No, it wasn't to fulfill the slaughter of the children. Though that's part of it, it was to give a witness to Herod and the Jews, their Messiah was born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So now notice what happened. Because of the wise men, the scholars of the Old Testament were made aware the king of Israel has come. And they knew Micah 5.2 is a prophecy of the king of Israel, where he'd be born. So in quoting that, in response to the inquiry of the wise men, that was now a witness to the Jewish scholars, the scribes of the Old Testament. Messiah has come. He's been born. He's in Bethlehem. Your Savior is here. What are you going to do with him? The prophecy has been fulfilled. The promise of God has been realized. It's been kept. Your king that you've been waiting for, the true king is not Herod and Edomian. A descendant of Esau. It's the Messiah. He's here. The wise men have come to worship the king of Israel. If these Gentiles are coming to worship him, how much more should you Jews be worshiping him? Because he is your king. The one you knew is prophesied to come. So it's not so much that the spirit being is bringing them to Herod with malicious intent to have Herod kill him. It's more that the spirit being is bringing the wise men as an announcement to them, as a witness to them, Herod and his court. The king of Israel, Messiah is here. What will you do with him? Will you now bow and worship him as you're expected to, or will you seek to oppose him, thereby bringing God's wrath upon you? Is it making sense so far? I don't know what ma means. I don't know what you mean. It was a bit of conviction, right? No. Why would it be two years later? Soretta, you're still not following me. If it's the star that's guiding them, that means it's the star's perfect timing for Herod to find out when he did. So I have no idea what you're talking about now, right now, Soretta, the sport. It's confusing me a little bit. It wasn't too late. It was God's perfect timing because that's when God wanted Herod to know. He's already been born. He's living in a house. He's now a child of about two years. So I don't understand. Hey, send Daniel on his merry way. Our friend Daniel wants to start preaching, so send him to his own YouTube channel. Right. 
Yeah, and Gia Smith is talking about being defiled like a filthy dog. So send her on her way too. Come on, guys. Okay, now everyone with me? Yes, I and yeah, and I still don't get the connection what you're saying, Sir at Spork. Obviously, the birth of Jesus wasn't such that got the attention of the whole world. The birth of Jesus was done discreetly and silently, so that I'm not surprised that Herod and his retinue would not be aware of this event, which why my interpretation of the text makes sense, because it wasn't something spectacular. The king of Israel did not descend from heaven with the heavenly host, you know, you know, lights, camera, and action. It was very discreetly and quietly done. Yet even though it was done quietly and discreetly, God wanted to announce the birth of the Messiah, even to Herod, as a witness to him, the king has come, and now you're expected and obligated to submit to him and worship him. So you see why I believe the star is a spirit being and why I don't expect it's uh, except that it's an evil spirit being. Is that making sense? Is everyone following me? Do you see my reasons why for believing it's a spirit being and not some object in space? Because the way this star is moving is quite unusual. I'm not saying God can't take an actual star in space and move it in that manner. He's almighty. He's sovereign. He controls the stars and can move the stars any way he delights, he deems fit. But it makes more sense that the star is a spirit being that's appearing as a star because he's communicating <clears throat> in a language on the level of the astrologers, right? So when people try to look for some astral phenomenon coinciding with the birth of Christ, even though it's admirable that they want to find some astrological, historical proof to confirm the specificity of Matthew 2, I don't think that's necessary because if you understand that a star can refer to a spirit being, then interpreting this as a spirit being makes more sense Contextually, so you don't need to look for some extra biblical historical astrological phenomenon taking place during the time of Jesus's birth. Is that clear? Just want to make sure I'm clear. I didn't confuse anyone. If someone's confused, let me know. Say, hey, I'm confused. I don't get your point. So these are my reasons why. I believe the star was a spirit being and not an evil, malicious spirit being, but a righteous agent of God sent to announce the coming of the Messiah to the wise men who were eagerly awaiting the prophecy of Daniel to be fulfilled and to announce to Herod and the Jews in Jerusalem, the true king of Jerusalem, the true king of Israel, the true king of Jews, who's the king of all nations, the king of all angels, the God-man has come. And he was born exactly where the prophet said he'd be born. And he's living in a house in that place. Now, what is your response to him? What is your response to him? Are you going to bow to him, worship him, submit to him? Or are you going to oppose him like Herod did? Are you going to oppose him like Herod did? Huh? You don't want to be in the camera. Huh? No, I'm going to be shocked. I didn't know you were going to come. Lena, I'll be at. I don't want to hold on. Hold on, guys. Let me take a. Go upstairs. Yeah, yeah, it's all right, fine. But I don't, I don't, I didn't know if you want to be on the camera. So. No, no. So I yeah, you I'm on. shorty all day in the noise. Now, what do you? Allahu Akbar. Allah. Hold, on. No, no. Yeah, hold on, guys. I don't want to be. Hold on, hold on one second.
One second, guys. This is what's beautiful about live stream. You're going to be live. You're going to be with me live. And I carry you with me wherever I go. We were sailing along on a moonlight bed. We were sailing along on a moonlight bed. By the way, the camera adds 50 pounds to me. I'm actually much skinnier. Caught in a trap and I can't walk out. Oh, I love you too much, baby. This is the beauty about live stream. Things happen beyond your control. There you go again. Accusing me of sin. We can't go on together with suspicious mind. We can't go on. Why can't you see what you're doing to me? Man, where do you get this? Only with me. There you go again. All right. Here's a me of sin. We handle. All right. So if I made a case. Okay. If I made a case that that star is a spirit being, that's clear. We can move on to another aspect of the prophecy. Okay. Where is the love? Okay. Now, why even appear as a star? Why even appear as a star? Are we now ready for the second part of this? Why would God send a spirit being to appear as a luminous, radiant star? Okay. Because of a prophecy that was mentioned by some in the text. It's now or never. I'm only telling you, be one, be one. George, brother, do I need to sound like a broken record? I just said nothing in the text says there were three kings. There were three wise men. How many times must I repeat myself? Nowhere in Matthew 2 does it say the wise men were three and only three. We are not given the number. They gave three gifts. Can we stop repeating that myth? Yes, Abd al-Halaj mentioned the star of Jacob. Now let me show you why the, the angel would have, have appeared as a star in order to fulfill Numbers 24, verse 17. But let's read Numbers 24, verses 1 to 9. Numbers 24, verses 1 to 9. Let's read that. Numbers 24, verses 1 to 9. Follow with me. I'm going to have to do part two because I'm going to go into a lot of meat on this star issue by the grace of Jesus Christ. Okay, listen, guys. Let's read. And when Balaam or Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord Jehovah to bless Israel, he went not, he went not as at other times to seek for enchantments, but he set his face toward the wilderness. The Israelites are in the wilderness. Balak or Balak wanted Balaam, Balaam to curse the Israelites, but he could not curse the Israelites because God would not let him curse the Israelites. So he looked at the people in the wilderness, Moses and the people, and notice what he did. Verse 2, and Balaam, Balaam lifted up his eyes and he saw Israel abiding in his tents according to their tribes, and the Spirit of God came upon him. I'm going to come back to verse 2 in a minute. The Spirit of God came upon him, and he took up his parable. Now, God is inspiring Balaam to prophesy. Notice the prophecy. Took up his parable and said, Balaam, Balaam, the son of Beor, hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said. Read with me, folks. Pay attention. A lot of meat here. <clears throat> he has said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. As the valleys are they spread forth, as gardens by the riverside, as the trees of lime aloes, which Jehovah the Lord hath planted, and as cedar trees beside the waters. God brought him forth out of Egypt. Talking about Israel. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Right? Don't get too hung up on unicorn. The Hebrew doesn't mean unicorn. So don't think it, the Bible's talking about mythical you know, animals, even though who knows whether unicorns existed or not. That's another issue. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, 
right? His enemies. Pay attention. And shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. Now notice verse 9. He couched, he lay down as a lion, and as a great lion, who shall stir him up? Blessed he, blessed is he that blesseth thee, and cursed is he that curseth thee. Right? Okay, do you see what happened here? Balaam is being hired by Balak to curse Israel. He can't. God is shutting his mouth. God is forbidding him. God is constraining, restraining him from cursing Israel. Instead, God is moving him to bless Israel. Right? Now notice the second part of the oracle, the blessing. Numbers, same chapter, 24, verses 15 to 19. Pay attention. Numbers 24, 15 to 19. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam, Balaam, the son of Beor, hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, he hath said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not so close, because this is going to happen in the future. In distant, I'm seeing the distant past. It's not going to happen now in my lifetime. It's going to happen way in the future. That's what it means, right? And what does he see? There shall come a star out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. Pay attention to the word scepter. We're going to come back. And shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. These are the enemies of Israel. And Edom shall be a possession. And notice Herod was an Edomite. He was an Edomian, an Edomite, Herod. Sierra, this is all in Syria, by the way, also shall be a possession for his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. So what is Balaam saying? A star will come out of Jacob who is a king, will have dominion. He'll have the scepter. Scepter. Don't forget the word scepter. The ruling staff of a king. When he comes, he will destroy the enemies of Jacob. A star will come out of Jacob. So notice this, the coming king of Israel. The coming king of Israel is called a star and a scepter. A star and a scepter. Now, do you understand why this angelic being would appear as a star? And the connection that the wise men made with the king of Israel, we saw his star. And you understand why Jesus in Revelation 22, 16 could say, I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Right? Do you see the connection, how everything is tying in perfectly? Because this star, this scepter, that will arise out of Jacob is a king, a conquering king who destroys the enemies of God, who will have dominion. Right? That's why he says, look, let's look at Numbers 24, 17 one more time. One more time to understand the language. Notice the language. I shall see him, but not now. Meaning, I'm seeing a vision of the king, but it's not going to happen now in my lifetime. I shall behold him, but not nigh. He's not near, because this is talking about the future. So though I'm having a vision and I'm seeing this, the fulfillment of this vision, the reality of which is still future. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. Side note. Balaam was a false prophet whom God had killed for his immorality and idolatry. Okay. But here's what's amazing. If you read Numbers chapters 22 to 24, read it at your own leisure. Numbers 22 to 24. This Balaam gets to see the angel of God visibly in human form with a sword that he was about to use to strike Balaam down until the donkey stood between the angel of the Lord and Balaam to save Balaam's life. And this Balaam received revelations from God and the angel of the Lord by the Spirit of God. Numbers 24, verse 2. Numbers 24, verse 2. Notice again. 
Notice he saw, talks about visions of the Almighty, knowing the Almighty, receiving words from the Almighty. Okay? Notice Numbers 24, 2. And Balaam lifted up his eyes, and he saw Israel abiding in his tents, according to their tribes. And the Spirit of God came upon him. Wow. Balaam was a Trinitarian. Thank you, Riaz. You beat me to it. If you read Numbers chapters 22, 23, 24, don't take my word for it. He sees the angel of God appear visibly. In fact, here, let me just give you the reference. Numbers 22, 31 to 32. He's a Trinitarian. Numbers 22, 31 to 32. Watch here. Numbers 22, 31 to 32. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. So he fell before the angel of the Lord, whom he saw visibly with a sword in his hand. He fell before him in worship. Notice 32. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. So guys, did you catch it? Balaam knows there's Jehovah. He knows there's the angel of Jehovah who appears in human form with a drawn sword to slay God's enemies. And this angel is worthy of worship because he's God. And he knows that he's inspired by the Spirit of God. Numbers 24, 2. Numbers 24, verse 2, one more time. Pay attention here. And Balaam looked up his eyes, and he saw Israel abiding in his tents according to their tribes, and the Spirit of God came upon him. Now, what are you supposed to learn from Balaam's example? Two things. God is so mighty and majestic, he can even cause false prophets to prophesy truth and prophesy his revelations. Yes, he's a false prophet that was killed. You read Numbers 31, you'll see that. Okay, are you with me there? Balaam is a false prophet who received inspiration from the Holy Spirit. So God is so big and majestic, he can even cause false prophets to prophesy the truth. And the Holy Spirit can even use false prophets to speak God's revelation. Topaz, if we're going to get into a debate about Balaam, you're going to have problems because Balaam instigated the sexual orgies between the Moabites and Midianites and the Israelites in Numbers 25 and 31. Stop talking about Balaam and questioning that he's an evil false prophet. Because so you hear, you see that God is majestic and mighty enough to even have the spirit inspire false prophets. Yeah, it's going to be your gosh pretty, pretty soon. You keep it up. Okay. False prophets to receive revelations from the spirit. Number two, the second thing you learn from Balaam. Here's the second thing you learn from Balaam. Even though you may be aware that the true God is triune, even though you may know the Trinity and know the Trinity is the true God, and that God is a Trinity, that still doesn't mean you're saved because Balaam knew the Trinity, experienced the Trinity, even had a vision of the angel of God where he saw the angel of God visibly and spoke to him face to face and was even inspired by the Spirit, and he still was an idolater killed and damned to hell. Thank you, Nada. Right? Exactly, Revelation 22, 13. So these were some side points that I wanted you to see. I wanted you to see that God is so sovereign and majestic, he can even inspire false prophets to speak truth. And the Holy Spirit is so majestic, he can even cause false teachers, false prophets to speak the truth and receive revelations to pass on to the people of God. You with me there? But now, do you see the prophecy in Numbers 24, 17? It says, 
a star and a scepter, right? Let's look at it one more time. I don't know why, Panagi, you went from lowercase to uppercase, putting everything in caps. Okay, number 2417, because I want to go a little more deeper and meet in this. Okay, watch here. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. That word scepter, that word is used in another place that's very important. Okay, now listen to me. Everyone listen, because you got to make a connection. And Abd al halaj can confirm. The Jews had one method of interpretation. They employed a hermeneutical principle, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of it. This hermeneutical principle is called Jizira Sheva or Shawa. Jazira Sheva or Shawa. Okay. Jazira Sheva or Shawa. Now, what does this hermeneutical principle imply? This principle was employed by the Jews where they would look at passages that either use the same words or spoke of the same concepts and combined them together. Are you with me there? Jezira, Jezira Shava, however you want to pronounce it here. I'm going to transliterate it. This was a hermeneutical principle where the rabbis looked for passages that either had the same words or the same word or the same concepts and combined them together in order to see whether those passages, when brought together, painted a bigger picture. So let's say one passage used a specific word and that word was used in another passage in a similar context. They will look at all those passages that had the same words or the same ideas to see if they can get a coherent picture or to see the bigger picture. Yes, we do that all the time, Jojo. We Christians do that too. So, Jizera Shawa. Now, why, why am I mentioning this? Do you see the word scepter there? It's used in the context of a coming king out of Israel, right? Coming king out of Israel. Because at this time, Israel had no king. They were not even in the land yet. Now, here's what's interesting. That word also appears in the prophecy of Jacob, when Jacob prophesied over Judah, his son. There he speaks about the scepter not leaving Judah. Genesis 49, 8 to 12. Genesis 49, verses 8 to 12, specifically verse 10. There the word scepter is used, the same word, and it's even the same concept. concept. Thank you, Jerry Wang. You found it. Genesis 49, verses 8 to 12. Guys, notice, same word scepter used in the same context of a king. Notice here. Judah, though thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise, thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. Notice. And by the way, the reason why it says you are he who your brothers will praise, because Judah means praise. It's a play on his name. Judah is a lion's whelp. Pay attention. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion. So notice Judah is described as a lion. And as an old child. Listen to me, guys. Listen. As an old child. I'm sorry. As an old lion. He's couched as a lion. As an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter. There's that word. Same word used in Numbers 24, 17, in the same context of a king who will be given dominion to destroy the enemies of God. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. Shiloh, that's a name that even the rabbis recognized <clears throat> belongs to the Messiah. In rabbinic tradition, one of the names of Messiah is Shiloh from this passage. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So when Shiloh comes, all the nations will be gathered to Shiloh. The scepter, the ruling staff, remains in Judah until Shiloh comes. Shiloh comes, he will rule, and all the nations will be gathered to him. 11 and 12. Binding his <clears throat> foal unto the vineyard <clears throat> and his ass's colt unto the choice vine, 
He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. Okay. You with me there? No, Shiloh, Tipple Bear. Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. Shiloh is not a place where the Lord dwells. Shiloh is the name of the Messiah. Let's not, stop being chiefs. Let's be Indians and listen. Everyone with me there? Okay. Did you guys, are you following me or did I lose you guys? Okay. You guys with me? The word scepter appears in Genesis 49.10. And it's used in Numbers 24, 17. And what's the common link between those two passages? Not only do they both use the word scepter, but it uses the word scepter in the same context of a king that will come. A king out of Jacob to rule and destroy the enemies of God. Right? Do you see that? The word scepter, same word used in same context of a king to come. Just want to make sure you're getting it. Okay, everyone got it? Okay. Now, in Numbers 24, it says the, the star, the scepter will come out of Jacob. But Genesis 49 is more specific. Genesis 49 tells us this king of Jacob, this king from Jacob comes from Judah, not from any of, of the other sons. So notice now, this concept, this hermeneutical principle of the Jews, where you take passages where the same word appears in same or similar context, combine them together to get a more coherent picture or to see the bigger picture. So now notice, when we apply this principle, a scepter king comes from Jacob, but Judah, then Genesis 49 is more specific, not just from any tribe of Jacob, from Judah. So now we got a picture. An Israelite, a descendant of Jacob will arise from the tribe of Judah, one of the sons of Jacob. He will be the ruler to destroy the enemies of God. Okay. Sorry, I, I buffered. Let me try this again. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Let's try this again. Applying this method called Jezera Shawa. Yeah, thank you, Abd al halaj Where same words are used in different books that have the same or similar context. Combine them together to get a coherent picture or a bigger picture. Scepter is used in Genesis 49.10. It's used in Numbers 24.17. And it's used in the same context of a king to arise out of Israel to destroy the enemies of God. Now, when we apply this method, here's what we just learned. An Israelite king a king from Israel, Jacob being the name for Israel, the nation, will arise from one of the sons of Jacob, particularly from the tribe of Judah. That king will arise to destroy the enemies of God. From Judah, he will arise, and all the nations will submit to him. You see what happened when you applied this hermeneutical principle? You now get a picture, a theme that runs throughout the Old Testament. A king will be sent an Israelite king, he will be an Israelite from the tribe of Judah. The nations will submit to him and will destroy the enemies of God. And this king is called a star, right? He was called a star. But did you notice that in Genesis 49, 10, let's look at it one more time. Let's look at Genesis 49. Let's read 8 to 10. One more time. Genesis 49, 8 to 10 to tie it in with Jesus. Then I want to show you how the Jews interpreted Numbers 24, 17. You sure it's David? Judah, thou, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Now notice verse 9. Judah's a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion and as an old lion who shall rouse him up. So notice, Judah's called the lion. And from Judah... <clears throat> 
Shiloh will come and the scepter will be his. The scepter will be his. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Hmm. Judah's the lion. The scepter of Jacob is a scepter entrusted to the line of Judah. And that scepter will be in the hand of Shiloh and all the nations will be gathered to him. So star of Jacob, Judah's a lion. And the star of Jacob is the scepter that is a king from Israel who's from the tribe of Judah because he is the one who will have the scepter. He is the Shiloh that all nations will be gathered to. Right? You got it now? Now, Revelation 5.5 5 and 22.16 makes sense. Revelation chapter 5, verse 5 and 22.16. Let's see if you guys get it now. Revelation 5, verse 5, 22.16. Judah's a lion. And a star will arise from Jacob, who's a king, who, and the scepter will be in his hand. And one of the others saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Hmm. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Hmm. The root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Wow. He's the lion of Judah. He is the bright and morning star. Lion, Judah, star. Hmm. Genesis 49, 8 to 12. Judah is a lion. The scepter, the ruling staff, the king's staff will remain in Judah until Shiloh comes. It will be in his hand. On all the nations will be gathered to him. And that Shiloh, that scepter, that king from Judah, is the star of Jacob. Hmm. Making sense? I know, Netta, you want to really connect it with the resurrection of Jesus. The plain reading of Numbers 24, 17 has nothing to do with the resurrection. It talks about from which nation he'll spring forth. Did everyone caught it now? Don't assume every term of rise means resurrection. Rise means to come forth, come out of. So he comes out of Jacob, not from any other nation. Right? Now, do you see nothing coincidental? The Bible supernaturally produced and that you have different pieces of the puzzle scattered throughout the Bible that you have to find and collect and piece together to see the coherent picture? Everyone got getting it now? Now let's see how the rabbis interpreted Numbers 24, 17 and Genesis 49. Did the rabbis agree that Genesis 49, verses 8 to 12, is about Messiah? And did the rabbis also agree that Numbers 24, 17 is about Messiah? Let's see. You guys ready for it? First of all, let me give you Rabbi, uh, Rashi's commentary. Here you go. Rashi was considered one of the greatest medieval rabbis who ever lived. Now, here's the link. So you guys don't take my word for it. Here's the link. Here it is. Click on it. You click on it. Guess what you're going to read? Until Shiloh comes. Notice what Rashi says. Genesis 49.10, Rashi, a medieval rabbi, considered one of the greatest, who's not a Christian, who opposed Christianity. Notice his commentary. Until Shiloh comes. This refers to the King Messiah. Oh, wow. So Shiloh is King Messiah to whom the kingdom belongs. And so did Ankelos render it until the Messiah comes to whom the kingdom belongs. According to the Midrash Agada, Shiloh is a combination. And it gives you the roots, a gift to him. As it is said, they will bring a gift to him who is to be feared. Hmm. So wait, Rashi, you are a medieval rabbi opposed to Christianity. Yes. But you're admitting that Shiloh is Messiah? Yeah. Oh, excellent. Hold on, Rashi. What about... Numbers 24, 17. Is that Messiah too? 
let's see what Rashi says. Here you go. Here's the link. Here's the link. Okay, here's the link. What does he say? Does he say this is about Messiah too? Let's look. Okay. Let me find it for you. Hold on. I got it. Okay. Did I, I think I gave you the wrong link. Hold on. No, that's the right one. Okay. Numbers 2419. A ruler shall come out of Jacob. Look at that right there. I think I gave it to you. Yeah, I did give it to you. There will be another ruler from Jacob. Now notice. And destroy the remnant of the city, of the most prominent city of Edom, that is Rome. He says this regarding the King Messiah, the King Messiah, of whom it says, and may he reign from sea to sea, and the house of Esau shall have no survivors. Wow, Rashi. So you're again saying Numbers 24 is about King Messiah. Yep, I said that. Interesting. You guys got it? So a medieval rabbi who opposes Christianity admits, rabbi, a medieval rabbi who opposes, he admits, admits it's about Messiah, right? Now let me show you what the Targum say. Targum pseudo Jonathan. Targum pseudo Jonathan. I don't know if I can fit all of this in. Here's the link. This is an Aramaic paraphrase of the Hebrew Scriptures. Targum Pseudo Jonathan. Here you go. I'll give you the link. Let me quote the relevant part. Quote the relevant part. I don't think I can post all of it. Let's see. Hold on. Okay, here you go. How does he interpret or this Aramaic paraphrase interpret Numbers 24? Okay, let's see. Here you go. This is Targum Pseudo Jonathan on Numbers 24. And they, at least in the days of King Mashiach. Oh, so even this Aramaic Targum interpreted Numbers 24 in reference to the days of King Messiah. This will be fulfilled when Messiah the King comes. Wow. Oh, my goodness gracious. Hold on. I got more. Uh, let's see. Here is Targum Ankelos, Ankelos, or Ankelos, of Numbers 20, <clears throat> 24. Here you go, Numbers 24, which was alluded to, I believe, by, was it Rashi? Anyway, Numbers 24, here you go. Let me quote that relevant part. Targum Ankelos, Ankelos. Notice how it rep uh, interprets Numbers 24. When a king shall arise out of Jacob and the Mashiach be anointed from Israel, he will slay the princes of Moab and reign over all the children of men. Wait, wait, wait. Another Targum, Aramaic paraphrase of the Pentateuch, translated by Jews, not Christians, admits that the scepter and the star of Jacob is none other than King Messiah, King Mashiach. Well, let's see how they interpreted Genesis 49. Are you ready for Genesis 49? Okay, let's see how they interpreted Genesis 49. Targum Ankelos, Ankelos. Here, let me see if I can first put the quote. Here you go. Targum Ankelos, Ankelos. Yeah, see, I got to cut it down. Okay. I'm going to cut it in half. Hold on. Here you go. I'll give you the link. He who exerciseth dominion shall not pass away from the house of Yehuda, nor the Safra from his children's children forever, until the Mashiach come, whose is the kingdom, and unto whom shall be the obedience of the nations, for whom the people shall obey. Wait, 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 wait. Targum on Kelos. Wait, wait, wait. The Shiloh is who? Until the Mashiach come. Whose is the kingdom, and unto whom shall be the obedience of the nations, or whom the people shall obey. Here's the link to that one. Here's the link. This is all online, translated, free of charge. What's up, Doc? There you go. What about Targum Pseudo Jonathan? 
Does Targum Pseudo Jonathan agree? Are we ready for Targum Pseudo Jonathan? Okay. Targum Pseudo Jonathan. Let's see if I can fit it all in. Targum Pseudo Jonathan. Okay, I'm going to have to cut it down. Here you go. Till the time that the king, the Mashiach, shall come, the youngest of his sons, and account of him shall the peoples flow together. How beauteous, beautiful, beautiful, be, man, dude, how beautiful, my goodness, how beautiful is the king, the Mashiach. I can't pronounce this. Beatuous, beatuous, how beatuous is the king, Mashiach, who arise from the house of Yehuda. That's Targum Pseudo Jonathan, folks. Here's the link. Goodness gracious. Goodness gracious. So notice, Targum Pseudo Jonathan, Targum Ankelos, one of the greatest rabbis who ever lived, the medieval rabbi Rashi, all of these Jewish sources admit Genesis 49, 8 to 12, and Numbers 24, 15 to 19 are about King Messiah, King Mashiach, Melek Mashiach, that the star, the scepter out of Jacob is Messiah, that Shiloh of Genesis 49, 8 to 12, the ruler who will rule and the nations will be gathered to from the tribe of Judah is Melek Mashiach, King Messiah. Even the Jews who oppose Christianity admit this is all referring to the Messiah. No wonder Matthew 2 records a star announcing, heralding, that the king of Israel, the Messiah, has been born. No wonder in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5 and 22, 16, Jesus describes himself and is described as the lion of the tribe of Judah, a direct allusion to Genesis 49, 8 to 12, and the bright and morning star, another allusion to a prophecy about the king that will come from Jacob, specifically an allusion to Numbers 24, 17. Yep. Did it sink in? So I'm going to have to do a session on the glory that Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6, and that was the glory of Jesus, who appeared to Isaiah in his pre existence as Jehovah God Almighty. But I hope these four sessions will prove to be a blessing to you. This is now the fourth session I did on the wise men and the birth of Jesus as part of the Christmas story. What I need you to do is to go back, re-listen to these four sessions, ask the Spirit to help you understand the arguments, absorb them, and then share them with others, pass on the links, especially to my YouTube channel. Subscribe if you haven't. Hit the like button. Keep praying for me that in the new year, miraculous things will be done for me and my daughters. The Lord Jesus will wash us in his blood, cover my daughters and I in his blood, fill us with the Spirit, seal us by the Spirit, help me to be holier and more in love with him, to be filled with more faith and knowledge to bless you and to save me from my trials and shackles and bring my daughters to me. And to serve Jesus until he takes me home or until he returns. Lord Jesus willing, I'll be back on during the week to talk about the glory that Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6. Who did he see? Was that Jesus who appeared as the God-man? And until then, be blessed. Even though we celebrated Christmas the other day, don't forget, Arminians celebrate Christmas on January 6th. And the Orthodox celebrated on January 7th. So... It's still not over. And for true believers, Christmas is every day. Every day we celebrate the birth of the God baby, God who chose to be born as a baby, the God man Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Save us, preserve us, seal us, wash us in the blood of Jesus, seal us by your spirit, and cause us to be in love with you and save us from Satan's sin in the world and from our own flesh. And Father, please fight for my children and I and bless us and keep us together and provide for me to get on my feet and depend on no one but on you. And bless your people here, Father, for the glory of Jesus and use my meager efforts to advance the kingdom of your son. We love you in Jesus' name. Lord bless you guys. See you soon, God willing.